All right, I'm Matt Marco. This is NORC Discussions, and I got Catherine Henry with me, who created Restore Michigan Initiative, which, uh, Catherine, you created basically because of the emergency powers that the governor has been using during this COVID lockdown, correct? And you wanted to uh, cor make some corrections because of that. Um, that's that's the main reason why I got involved with this, absolutely. Um, but it, it's it's not this isn't just like a, the governor's repeal or anything. It, it goes to issues much bigger than that. Really. And what you are proposing is a constitutional amendment to the Michigan Constitution, and you are in the process, at the final process, of collecting the signatures needed to force, uh, or at least to put this ballot proposal. And I guess that would be the November ballot, correct? Yep. Yeah, we yeah. are. Um, yep, is a constitutional amendment. Um, and so by gathering the signatures now, we need 425,059 good signatures turned in by a week from today in order to put us on the ballot for November 3rd. Mm -hmm. And the main, the main uh, purpose of this was to uh, was to correct the the uh, governor's uh, emergency powers and and to also uh, enact some other changes correct and what well how could you uh, summarize what the changes would be yeah so um basically um it's important to realize that i'm not changing the foundations or the structure of our government you know, we are guaranteed that uh, Republican form of government under Article 4, Section 4 of our U.S. Constitution. So this is all serving to clarify and uh, rip away the extra stuff so we can really get back to having that uh, Republican form of government. But um, the, the amendment clarifies and strengthens our due process right. Um, it clarifies separation of powers and um, how we're supposed to interpret state law since uh, it's been crazy to hear how um, our governor and our attorney general and a few judges think that you could cherry pick the laws in our state. Um, it uh, emphasizes that, you know, in times of emergency, our government does not have additional increased power over us and, and we don't lose or diminish our rights in times of emergency. Um, it streamlines and clarifies the roles of courts and the function of our court so that people can truly be engaged in, in that process. Um, and basically increasing that whole concept of governmental uh, transparency, accountability, accessibility, because we can't have a Republican form of government where the people are the ones in, in control if we don't even have access to our government in the first place. So um, those are some, some big things um, in there. Um, you know, administrative rules and regulations that have no place in a republic, uh, those are restricted and removed, uh, at least from controlling the people. And um, so those are, I guess, the basic highlights, I guess, from the, uh, the petition as a whole. Yeah, this is a very in-depth, this goes way beyond the governor's uh, emergency powers. And I see it goes into many other aspects of the, the functioning of the state government, correct? I see that, all, also, from what I, I've, I see in there, it, it ends the immunity for legislators. So and do you think do you think that would create a problem for trying to attract good people to be a legislator because they won't have that immunity? They could be sued personally. Um, there isn't a, um, a you know an, um, isolating or singling out of legislators in terms of immunity. It's um, it's more of if we have a government official at all, you know, anyone who's elected or appointed and they're serving us, and if they have intentionally violated our constitution, mm -hmm. then that's a crime. Uh, it, it, it is and it should be, and it's, it's more specifically stated in there now. And so if they've done it twice, uh, intentionally violated our constitution, then they're going to be removed from office in addition to whatever criminal criminal penalties there would be. So um, that definitely would not dissuade um, good people from running because good people are not going to be the ones um, intentionally violating our constitution. So 
you know, it, uh, it's not going to cover some situation where somebody is, you know, truly acting in good faith and they are trying to perform the, you know, the roles of their job as best they can. And they, you know, they're slightly misguided. And so, you know, there's some issue that way. That's not the kind of situation that would leave them high and dry in that regard. It's so your your change says they, own, they after the second violation, then uh, their immunity ends, or is it end the immunity right at the beginning? Um, yeah, for for a large portion, the immunity would end from any intentional acts of uh, violating our constitution. Okay, um, that that part doesn't come into play just at the second time that it happens. Gotcha, um, because. Quite frankly, we have a con anyone who serves uh, in public office here in Michigan, anyone who's a licensed attorney or a police officer or a school board member, uh, we all have to take the same oath in our state constitution to uphold the U.S. and Michigan constitution always. And so anyone who violates that oath needs to be held accountable. And what we've seen in the last few months here is just an, a, an immense amount of the people who have taken that oath just kind of walk away and ignore it. Uh, whether it's because they're actively um, violating, you know, somebody else's constitutional rights, or they're just sitting back, washing their hands of the whole thing, and allowing other people to do so, and neither of those options are are acceptable. Right. We took an oath; we have to take it seriously. I see another aspect of your initiative would also end uh, commissions in the state government, including the Civil Rights Commission. Is that uh, is that the intention? Um, so not necessarily to all commissions. Um, so when it comes to commissions, there should be no um, administrative body, an unelected official who, uh, or group of, you know, body of, of unelected officials who are making rules and regulations for us, the people. Uh, we have to, we've taken the whole concept for granted that we have this big uh, bureaucratic gov government with a bunch of red tape and, and acronyms we don't even understand, you know, for all the different departments and bureaus and commissions. Uh, it, it's really not, we need to get back to basics. We need to get back to what our U.S. Constitution requires, which is simply that Republican form of government where we elect people to act on our behalf in the government. All of those administrative agencies or, you know, officials that are just appointed, they're not elected and they should not be um, in that constitutional republic, they should not be in a position to make rules and regulations as against us, the people. Uh, if an administrative agency has rules for basically self-management of the government, that's one thing, but not to regulate us as individuals because that's what the constitution and that's what the, the laws that are constitutionally passed are for. So when it comes to the Civil Rights Commission, there's an additional hurdle or I guess an additional problem uh, in terms of meeting constitutionality. So our, the way that it currently sits, our um, um, Civil Rights Commission is unconstitutional in accordance with the U.S. Constitution, um, and it's entirely inconsistent with the rest of our state constitution because we not only have that delegation of power to unelected eight unelected individuals that are appointed by the governor, mm -hmm. but in this particular situation, the Civil Rights Commission was delegated um, legislative authority so they can promulgate rules and regulations uh, to rule the people. Okay. Then they were given executive authority and they're allowed to issue subpoenas and do investigations and prosecute uh, allegations of uh, violations of Civil Rights Act. Uh, and then they're also given judicial powers so they can hold hearings and uh, come to conclusions and make essentially awards or, um, I'm losing my word, but uh, you know, uh, ramifications for uh, the violations of civil rights, uh, you know, laws. So no one person, no one body, whether elected or unelected, should ever have powers of more than one branch, certainly not more than, uh, you know, all three branches of government all at once. That's, you know. That's and and, and, and regarding things like regulations and stuff, I think it also says in your initiative that only doctors can be uh, regulating doctors and uh, and and so on uh, is I believe that's in there too, correct? So yeah, we have um, something in there. Let's see. I was going to try to find the exact part of it, but um, I know what you're talking about. Um, there is when it comes to having um, like regulatory bodies. Right. Um, shoot. 
can't Yeah, I think it said in there for regulatory bodies, you only have doctors, um, regulating doctors. Yeah. So Article 5, Section 5 of our current constitution says that a majority of, of members of an appointed examining or licensing board of a profession shall be members of that profession. Right. And I crossed off majority and I wrote all because there's no reason, you know, for example, with, with Carl Mankey, the, the barber, if right. uh, there's somebody who has served as a truck driver their entire life and have nothing, you know, no experience or understanding or qualifications with relation to cutting hair, there should be no reason why that individual is on a board telling uh, barbers how to cut hair or what sanitary, you know, conditions would look like or anything like that. So um, it gets to the... Um, um, you know, to the heart of having people that are appropriate uh, making those rules and regulations or to um, facilitate something that's common sense in each profession. Okay. However, you do think that somebody from outside would probably be more objective than somebody that has sort of the, uh, the bias of trying to protect their industry, you know, so that would be an advantage having somebody from outside the industry. Wouldn't you agree? No, I don't think so because um, just because somebody is on the outside doesn't mean that they're not biased. I mean, we all have a bias, no matter what what uh, topic we're talking about, no matter what walk of life we come from. We all have our own preconceived notions about things and biases. So, um, just having somebody who's specifically not uh, in that particular profession doesn't mean that they're going to bring something valuable to the table with that particular subject matter. Um, right. And it doesn't. Our constitution doesn't require that you have. A certain amount of people that are not in the profession it just it just says that there's a bar of um it has to be a majority a simple majority of those people have to be right. uh, members of that profession so okay and and i also think i saw in there that uh, it would make it easier to get injunctions to stop projects uh what uh, um i think that's in there isn't it uh, to stop projects it's easier to get an injunction or something no no, All right, I guess I'd have to go through that again. Yeah, it's, but, um, I know, I believe I know what you're talking about. Um, I just need the first page of our petition here. Sorry, give me a second. Um, and I'd like to point out that you are also a, a lawyer, and uh, yeah. you've, uh, what is your, uh, your, your expertise of law, that, uh, your focus? Oh, um, I have practiced in nearly everything that there is. I, I've okay. never done uh, medical malpractice, but that's about the only one I haven't touched. Okay, very good. Because this, I, I'm impressed how in depth this constitutional amendment gets as far as restructuring the state government. So I figured you had, and you wrote this whole thing, correct? I did write it. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's restructuring things. It's peeling away the extra layers that have been added on that don't belong there. But what would you say um, are the uh, the the bottom line advantages of uh, if this were? to be voted in and enacted um, th that you're trying to achieve here? Um, it, I guess it would just boil down to restoring that Republican form of government. I mean, it depends on how simplistic of an answer that you would like, but you know, we need to get to a point where we have true transparency in government, where we have true accessibility to our government. And those two pieces then lead for the ability or a better enable the ability to have true accountability for our government. So when we have different kinds of, you know, boards or officials that are unelected, there's no accountability there. There's no uh, accessibility. Um, when we have a situation where, you know, there's branches of our government that are exempt from things like FOIA requests as is currently now, or where we th have a, a situation where our governor thinks that she can set aside open meetings acts or, you know, freedom of information acts or things like that. There's definitely no accessibility to our government or accountability or transparency. And, you know, whether people like it or not, our, our constitution is our governing document, period. Um, if anything goes outside of the bounds of what the U.S. Constitution requires, um, it's, it's null and void on its face. Gotcha. Uh, and it, our state constitution serves the same kind of purpose. Um, our state constitution has to fall in line with the U.S. Constitution, but to the extent that it doesn't go outside of those bounds, then anything that it says is the controlling law of the land here in Michigan. So we, it's this whole purpose, everything in here is to rein all that back in. And remember that Article 1, Section 1 of our state constitution says that the people hold all the power here. 
And we need to make sure that that's true. We can't just keep stripping people of that, the people of that power and distancing and disenfranchising people so much that they don't really participate in government. But right. um, I do have an answer for you on that other piece that you were talking okay, good. about. Um, so it actually ties in with what we were talking about earlier with immunity. Um, but it's a, it's a new section. It would be, um, uh, I believe it's um, tw section 12 uh, G of article three of our state constitution. Um, and it goes to the concept of um, that any public official, public employee, or just member of the general public may bring an action in court for violation of a constitutional provision or a law by a public body or public official. So, you know, if we have, I don't know, a city manager who is violating our state law or state constitution and, um, the, you know, members of that public want that stopped and there, there doesn't seem to be any other mechanism for stopping that that uh, those individuals of the members of the public uh, can take that um, public official to court to compel compliance or to further uh, prevent further non-compliance. And so that kind of gets into that language um, as far as um, getting a preliminary injunction that you were asking about. That's with regard to, you know, such as we see here when the legislature sued the governor and wanted that, um, you know, that in initial or preliminary injunction put in place at the initial time they went to court with the Court of Claims. They were saying to the court, what she's doing is unconstitutional. It needs to be stopped right now while we sort the rest of this out. We can't sit around and, and allow this unconstitutional behavior to continue. Um, and so I agree that that's, that request should have been granted. And hopefully the uh, Michigan Supreme Court will jump in and make that happen very, very soon here. But in any regard, that's what it's about. It's not about particular government projects or anything of that nature. It it's goes right to the core of if something is being done that is blatantly illegal or un unconstitutional. Gotcha. Well, I give you a lot of credit. A lot of people just sit around and complain and you are actually doing something about it. And you've put together quite an organization that is necessary to get all those signatures. So um, I give you a lot of credit. You're an active person and uh, you've got a week to go to get the signatures. How far along are you at this point? you know or uh, oh i honestly have no idea we have it's hard to know people in right now that are processing all those signatures and um in fact we have somebody showing up at the door that uh i'm going to send one of my teammates over to, to catch we have people that are dropping off signatures every hour of the day every day so well, it, I, I give you a lot of credit you're a, you're an active person involved in the government and that's what we at the North Oakland Republican Club try to do is get people involved and educated and informed and, and thank you for helping us inform people on uh, the Restore Freedom Initiative that you've uh, started here. And uh, I will put up on here the uh, way people can get a hold of you, which is, uh, is there, there's a website that they can get a hold of and see where your petition drives are going on, correct? Yep, so restorefreedommi.com is our website. We have a, an email, which is restorefreedommi at gmail.com, but we also have a phone number that is uh, 616. 303-0093, so people can call or text that as well. All right, Catherine Henry, thank you very much for your time and informing us, and, and good luck to you.